Anyway, um, so here we have some uh, some strange pictures. We have the one ring, just in case anybody doesn't know which one the ring is. It's that one. We have uh, the Dark Lord of the Sith, my boy Darth Vader. Very Darth Vader. Uh, and we have macros. So uh, just in case, that's macro. Or that's the definition for uh, using macro. So I'm going to give everybody a little quiz. Uh, it's very important. So what do these three things have in common? And Fortunately, I know we all hate quizzes. I especially hate essay questions, so this is going to be multiple choice. Um, is it A, ruled by an evil dictator? We have, we have some unsavory characters up here. We have uh, Sauron, the Sauron. We have the Emperor, uh, and we have Jose Valin. So that's A. Or is it B, uh, incredibly powerful and dangerous, but can still be used for good in the right hands? Uh, also some unsavory characters up here, and this little devil cartoon character, which is the best I can find, so. Um, just to review our choices, because this is, sorry, I'm not, okay, just to review our choices, because uh, this is a pretty tough quiz, is it A, evil dictator, or B, powerful but dangerous? And I think we can pretty quickly rule out A, um, I think it's totally unfair, the emperor actively trains apprentices, so by definition he is not a dictator, so we gotta rule that out. And, so that leaves us with B. Um, just kidding, just kidding. Everybody knows Jose is like the nicest guy in programming, so don't don't go and like tell him I said this, even though this will be on YouTube. Anyway, um, yeah, B, powerful but dangerous. And that's kind of going to be the theme of this talk. Um, why is it powerful? Well, we can do things with macros that we can't do using regular functions. Um, I am opinionated and. Technically, these are opinions, but I think there's more, more, more or less facts. You can be the judge of that. So, number one, macros are more complicated than functions. Uh, number two, macros are harder to debug. And three, macros are harder to test. Um, and also, kind of a, a fourth point, I know everybody gets sick of talking about Ruby in the lecture conference, but uh, I do Ruby from 9 to 5, and the absolute worst problems I've ever had to solve or when people were metaprogramming unnecessarily. Um, that's sort of a lot of my motivation for doing this talk because I don't want that to seep over into the electric community. So with that being said, macros are an incredibly useful and powerful feature and you should not be discouraged from using macros when it actually applies. Um, so here's an example of when you might need to use a macro. Let's say I wanted to be able to take a mathematical expression and compute, or no, not compute, excuse me, log the steps that the literature takes to solve that problem. I couldn't do this with a regular function because what's going to happen is I'm going to call analyze, which is a terrible name, don't name yourself analyze. Um, I'm going to pass this expression into analyze, and this is going to equate to be 1.5 before it ever gets to analyze. So if we wanted this, well, we can't really construct that from 1.5. That just doesn't work. Um, but we can do that with macros, and it comes at a price. Because, like I said, macros are more difficult to understand, maintain, debug, and test. So here's what you would see if you were using a function. And here's what a macro sees. If you haven't seen an Elixir ASC before, this is what it looks like. And frankly, this is a pretty basic one. Um, so I don't think it's really debatable that 1.5 is easier to understand than this crazy nested tuple of rage. That's the only way I can describe it. Trying to debug that just makes me really sad. Um, so like I said, this is an AST, and before we can really talk about macros, we need to know more about the AST. So in Chris McCord's book, which is awesome by the way, Metaprogramming Elixir, I suggest you read it if you have any uh, interest in metaprogramming or writing a library. Uh, a macro's purpose in life is to interact with the AST using Elixir's high-level syntax. And it stands for abstract, excuse me, stands for abstract syntax tree. Uh, and that's how we metaprogram. We manipulate ASTs at runtime. And the cool thing about ASTs is they are written in Elixir, so it's really easy to work with them. We don't have to drop down to C or whatever language um, another AST might be written in. So let's look at an AST. Here I have this uh, REPL session that I have open, and I have this function sum, which doesn't actually exist, and it's taking a list of integers, and 
we can get any valid Elixir's ASC representation by passing it into a quote block. We say quote do, and then it will spit out the ASC. Uh, and what you get is a three element tuple, where the first element is the function name, or variable name, or macro name. And the second item is a list of metadata, if applicable. And the third item is the arguments passed in from left to right. But some Elixir literals are already in their valid ASC form. So some of the ones that will return themselves. Um, you can see up here, integers, uh, character lists, strings, lists, two element tuples. And the ones that don't are three element tuples, variables, maps, and macros. Additionally, anything that's not included in that list will continue to be expanded all the way out until you get down to something defined on kernel special forms, which is basically the building blocks of the winter. So now, whoa, that's a lot of clicking. Okay, so I bought a Targus clicker. I don't recommend it. Go with the Logitech one, because uh, this keeps happening, and so I'm pushing the button like super gently, and I guess I'm an ape or something, because it just keeps going multiple times. Anyway, so now let's take a look at a macro. Um, here's, so the anatomy of a macro, they're always going to receive an AST and they're always going to return an AST. And you can, you have two types of macros. You can define a regular macro saying def macro foo, whatever you want to call it. And then you also have a special using macro, which you can define functions, you can define more macros, and every module that uses um, that module that has the using macro, everything inside of there will be evaluated in the context of that calling module, and we'll see an example of that later. So, a lot of the examples that I'm going to give, actually all the examples that I'm going to give, you, they, I'm going to use the most basic macro that you can possibly get, which is a macro that doesn't do anything, for the most part. And we'll see how complicated it gets uh, when we're literally not doing anything. So, uh, it seems that the canonical example and intro to macros has been re-implementing the if statement, because if you didn't know, there is no if statement in Elixir. It's a part of the language, it's a macro. Um, turns out a lot of things in Elixir are just macros. So, just to kind of point this out up here, on line three I have a comment that says the macros context. Up there, everything kind of behaves as we expect. There are, you can, Make functions, you can make variables, you can pretty much do whatever you want and things behave as expected. Down here in this quote block, that is going to be what the macro returns and it will be basically injected into the caller's context. And that's where things start to get a little bit weird. So first we will just uh, see if the things that I've said are holding true. Um, right now we're just going to inspect the condition and we're going to inspect the block of our if, of our if macro. And we will call it down here in our REPL session, and I'm only just passing in string foo. We're not, we're not doing anything. So, like I said before, the tuple is a, or excuse me, an AST is a three element tuple. We have a equals equals macro. Uh, it came in on line four, and there's our arguments one two, and our block is the string foo. So, pretty straightforward, right? Not, not a big deal. Um, but let's actually implement our macro because we can't really do a whole lot of useful things in the macro context. So what we do here is we unquote our condition, which if you remember is one equals equals two. And basically what that's saying is, hey, we're returning a giant, a, we're returning an AST in this quote block, but I don't want to use an AST right here. I want the actual evaluated value. So obviously one equals equals two is gonna be false. So we're gonna return something that's basically case false. Uh, so we all know what's going to happen there. Result when result in false nil, it's going to return nil. Otherwise, we unquote the block, we inject that value back into our macro. Uh, and by the way, there's going to be a lot of code in this, and it's going to get a little bit more uh, compact than this, so if you want to see the code, feel free to move up. There's a lot of empty space. So this is pretty simple, and not, not too not too difficult to grok, but it's not really all fun and games. It only gets more difficult from here. Here it is. Here's kind of what we have with the inspect block. We have our AST and we have our string. Um, but all we're doing here is returning a string. I don't know what everybody does for your job, but my job rarely consists of returning strings. Usually we're doing something a little bit more interesting than that. Uh, but at the same time, I want to keep this example simple. So let's sprinkle on 
the absolute minimum amount of complexity that I think is possible, and instead of returning that string, we will inspect it. So that blows up pretty quick. Um, still not super complicated. I think if we actually if we absolutely had to get through this, we could. So uh, you know maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe macros aren't evil. Maybe this is uh, maybe this is just a little bit of negativity on my part. You know, dark side and evil and Frodo and all this. Maybe I'm just full of it. So let's let's take a look at this. So we have a three element tuple. <coughs> We're calling it dot, and we have a list with another list and aliases and more aliases in my module, and I, I don't even know, I can't. Yeah, so apparently Vader has something to say here. Let's see what he's got going on. Hmm, I hate it when somebody proves me wrong. Earlier I said we have our my if statement over here, um, and as we know, the AST has to be fully expanded, and we saw that we implemented my if with a case statement. So this thing is not really fully expanded. So let's see what fully expanded AST looks like. So that got kind of out of control real quick. So imagine you're working with somebody's library or somebody's source code that you're taking over and you come to a part of the code where somebody used a macro and they need to, and now you have to debug this instead of the normal uh, nice function that you could have debugged. So just kind of parse this for a second and think about that. Yep, I get pissed. That's how I feel. I just, I feel the rage building up. It's like when I'm working on Ruby and somebody met a program for no reason. It's just dark side, man, you go there. Um, so that brings me, that, that is all the service of my first point. Macros are complicated, more complicated than functions. I think that that is not disputable because Elixir is never going to be less complex than its ASC representation. It can be equally as complex because some literals return themselves, but most of them do not. So let's move on. Macros are tougher to debug. This is how I feel after looking at a macro for a long time. Beaten and worn down and like I am totally being controlled by this horrible, terrible thing. But before we can look at um, debugging, we need to talk about macro hygiene for a second. So macros have the concept of hygiene, uh, which means that the context of a macro won't infect or contaminate the context of the caller unless we explicitly tell it to. So up here, we have our module bar. We have two functions, hygienic and unhygienic. They both bind x to 1. They call hygienic foo and unhygienic foo respectfully, and then they return x. And we have our module foo, which has two macros, unhygienic foo and hygienic foo. And you can see that hygienic foo simply binds x. And unhygienic foo has this bar bang notation. And what this means is, hey, go into the calling context, find a variable x, and override that value. So this allows you to clobber that variable's value, and this one will not. So if we log that to the console, you will see that that's true. So now when we talk about debugging, <coughs> once again, we're going to start off with a real simple example. We're uh, going to have a module called basic math, which we're actually not doing any math. I'm just going to keep with the passing in math theme. And we're just going to inspect that AST. We're not. Just ignore that. And um, we're going to drop into a prize session up here. Uh, we'll do that on the next slide. Sorry. Um, so we have our, our, our uh, function down here. We're going to bind x to caller x. And we are going to bind x to x in our macro and y to y. We're going to inspect those two things and we're going to drop them into the debugger. So keep in mind that we have to pry on line 8 of this macro. That's kind of important. So we'll call our function. So we see it print the things as we would expect. x is x, y is y, and we drop it to our pry. And now the weird thing here is that our, we don't see our pry. We see our pry where we call the macro. So that might throw you through for a loop when you're debugging a little bit, because usually when you drop into a pry session, you expect to be exactly where the pry is. And I believe that happens, I'm, I'm a little shaky on this, I believe that's going to happen because ultimately that macro is only going to return the, the final AST, and you can't actually, you, 
can't actually get into that during runtime. I have to dig into that a little bit more. Um, anyway, so then some more weird things happened. We printed our X and we printed our Y from macros, and now we, from our macro, and then now we put Y into the console, and we would expect to see the value for Y that we defined in our macro, because that's where our pry is. Well, it doesn't exist, because our macro only returns the AST, and at this point, that variable Y does not exist. Um, and then if we call X, we have caller X, which is um, what we would what we would expect to see because we didn't override the variable X. But then also you see the variable X was also was printed up there with the value X. So we kind of have two different values for X depending on if you're a puts debugger or a pry debugger. That can be confusing. So not not too much more difficult, but you do have to keep some more things in mind. And that brings me to my third point. Uh, macros are harder to test. And this is my opinion. I don't think it's actually harder to write the code, but I do think that it's more difficult to make it completely clear about what you're actually testing. So, who has kids? Anybody have kids? I have kids. All right. Um, so in my uh, younger developer days, I thought I was going to be some rock star open source developer. I was going to be on like some core team or just be some awesome dude who writes like a bunch of cool stuff, right? Turns out that's really hard to do when your two-year-old is driving Tonka trucks on your face while you are trying to write code. Um, so I decided that I was going to get back to the community by trying to speak. And at some point I was like, well, I really want to get more into Elixir, so I need to find something to write. And there was no Spotify API wrapper. And I was like, well, API wrappers are easy. Like, there's not going to be a whole bunch of maintenance once it gets up. Let me just do that real quick. So I did that. So I wrote a library called Spotify EX, which I was pleasantly surprised to see somebody had on a slide earlier. Um, and so far, all of our macros have been of the dev macro sort. But we're going to take a look at one of the using versions. And I'm going to use uh, an actual example that I pulled out of my Spotify library. So, like I said earlier, using will take everything inside the using block and inject that into the calling module. And just for some context, where I'm using it is I have a module called Responder, which each of my modules in Spotify EX can use that to handle uh, HTTP responses and then pass that off to some kind of function that uh, defines how that function should handle a response. So, like in this example, I have Spotify Artist that uses the Responder. So if basically, if there's a HTTP code with an error 400, it logs the error. If there's a 200 response where you have an empty body, it just says OK. And then if there's a response body, then now it will rely on a callback implemented by Spotify artists to determine how to handle that response because it needs to take that JSON and uh, convert it into a list of structs or a struct or whatever that data needs. So there's an example. So like here's an endpoint, we get artists. We get our URL, we pass that into our client, and then we handle response. And here's the, respond, the responder module. And one of the interesting things about this is right here you'll see a function called build response. This is the entire module. This build response is not defined anywhere in here. So you would think that, that the compiler would, well, would kind of throw up when you did that, but it won't because Elixir knows that this, everything inside of this macro is going to be evaluated inside of another macro's context, or not another macro, excuse me. Everything inside of this macro will be evaluated in another module. So, like I said, handle response, 200, 299, okay. Otherwise, message, otherwise, uh, build a response back. So, the problem I have here is I wanted to test these functions, and it's kind of, it's a little bit more tricky, it's a little bit trickier to test these because this, you know, you can't just get into a pry session and call responder handle response. It has to be inside of a different context. So that was kind of an interesting uh, question that I had to answer when I decided to test these. And truthfully, I'm not really happy with my test for these. So I will share some of my shame with you guys. And uh, I have two different ideas for how to test these. And I would love to hear any opinions about which one you think is the right one. Like I said, a lot of code for this part, but uh, you don't really have to see it. 
Anyway, so this part right here is actually our test. And I'm describing the response, and I'm testing each of the three functions. But I have to provide some kind of context for these, uh, for our macro to be included in it. So I built a fake playlist API up here. I'm using our responder module, and I just stub out the things that need to be stubbed out. And now I can call fake playlist API sub endpoint, and I can assert that handle response is doing the right thing. But it's not very clear because I'm saying describe handle response, but I'm calling some endpoint. Uh, so if the test works fine, but when somebody jumps into this because maybe they want to make a PR or fix a bug, you know, just whatever, they're gonna, it's gonna take them a second to grok this. And maybe a year later or whatever, when I go look at this, I might have to take a second to, to grok this. So that's option one. And option two was, well, I can just use responder in my test. But that feels really weird too, because now, like, what's responder? Is it a is it a test library? Is it some some thing that gives me some magic testing abilities? I don't know. Um, it's kind of nice because now I can call handle response directly because we're using responder here. But it just feels wrong. Your, in my opinion, your test should not be the context that you're uh, that you're testing a macro in. So. I went with the first option. Uh, I would love to hear opinions about it. So tweet at me, stop me in the hall, yell at me, whatever. Um, I would love to hear opinions. Oops, too far. So, so far that's, that's been a lot of, of negativity about macros, but I want to reiterate that macros are awesome because they let you do stuff that you can't do with functions. So when should you actually use macros? My opinion is that you use macros when you have to manipulate your AST in order to do the thing you want to do. If not, function composition is probably your best bet. So going back to the beginning of the slide, or excuse me, the beginning of the talk, we had our, our analyzed math function that took a uh, expression and printed out the steps that lets you go through to solve that in order. Um, and here's what the code might look like or something like that. And this is just a quick and dirty example. It could probably be done better, but I just kind of whip this up real quick. Um, there's a lot of cool functions that you can use with macros, like macro post walk and pre walk is an example. So post walk will let you walk the AST uh, depth first, and pre walk will let you um, walk the AST breadth first. And in this case, if I post walk, it goes through the steps to solving them uh, in reverse. So I can post walk that, stuff all that into an agent, um, and then basically just reverse that and pop the stack and I can manipulate my AST down here as I go, and I can print the steps. So there's no way I can do that with a function because the function would have just gotten 1.5 and you can't do anything with 1.5. So when else should you use macros? Um, when you need to inject code in multiple places and require is not doing the trick for whatever reason, or you really want to have a DSL because you're building a library, or whatever reason there's no hard and fast rules to writing, to writing DSLs, uh, you have to make that call. But I think that you should avoid it unless it's really necessary. So the, the moral of the talk is be good and not evil. Um, typos, geez. Unless when you need to be evil. That's those last minute conference, jit conference jitters where you're changing your slides right before you're about to get up there and you make an awesome glaring typo. So that's pretty cool. Um, so far, this has been a lot of doom and gloom. Macros are bad, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, but we've also seen how powerful they are. And as Elixir developers, uh, we have access to that power at all times. And it's up to us to use it when it makes sense. So going back to our Star Wars sort of theme that we had, um, the whole time we're like, oh, Luke, come to the dark side, blah, 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 come, come be bad with me. We'll take over the world or universe or galaxy or whatever. Um, and, and Luke's basically like, nah, dad, I'm good. I'm just gonna do my thing. And finally, he was like, well, I really gotta take out my dad because he's going to get my sister and she's gonna be corrupted. So I don't know if you've seen the old, the newer Star Wars, where they have like these really elegant lightsaber battles and Obi-Wan ultimately wins by like taking the high ground so that magically makes him the winner. Um, well, Luke didn't really do that. He just 
basically got really pissed and beat the hell out of Vader. Um, so that's kind of like, in my opinion, that's like tapping into the dark side. I mean, he just beat the shit out of this dude. Uh, but when he was done, he stopped and he went back to being good. So he used it when he needed to, and then he, and then he stopped. Um, and if we look at what happened in Lord of the Rings, well, our uh, hero Frodo, he kind of used the ring all the time. And uh, it corrupted him. And at the end of it, he pretty much got lucky that the weird little creepy golem creature jumped into the fire with the ring because he wasn't going to destroy it. So be like Luke. Don't be like Frodo. Only use it when you need to. And if you do, you'll be really happy that you did because you won't have to debug that macro a year down the road or anywhere, anytime in the future. Uh, that's all I got, so I'm going to take questions outside because I know it's the end of the day and I'm sure a lot of people want to be traffic or just get out of here. Thank you.